Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander, and welcome to The Great War, which is being filmed today in our special COVID-19 lockdown studio, also known as my living room. Now, despite these trying times, we still feel like it's important to remember history, even when we're living through historic times ourselves. So let's jump right into this episode of April 1920. Now, during the Great War, the Arab-speaking provinces of the Ottoman Empire had been an active theater of fighting, mostly between the British and the Ottomans. Once the fighting ended at the end of 1918, British and French troops, mostly British, occupied the area. By the spring of 1920, it was time to start making decisions, and some of the most important decisions would be made at the Conference of San Remo, which occurred in April 1920, 100 years ago and affected the future map of the Middle East, especially the provinces of Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Mesopotamia, today's Iraq. Now to understand how the map of the Middle East got redrawn at the Conference of San Remo, we've got to start before 1914. The region is strategically and economically important back then as well, especially to Britain. Because for Britain, this is the lifeline through the Suez Canal to their possessions in India. Now, the French also had interests there. In particular, the French viewed themselves as the protectors of the Christians, in particular Catholics, in the Middle East. And of course, Russia was also involved. They wanted access to the Mediterranean Sea up in Turkey at the Straits. But they also saw themselves as the protector of Orthodox Christians in the Middle East. But there were important economic reasons for all of these powers to pay attention to the Middle East in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was a huge producing region of cotton, silk, and of course, oil. And this is what led to the European powers forcing the Ottoman Empire to give them economic concessions and advantages, called the capitulations. So these forced economic advantages to the Western powers were one of the most important reasons why the Ottoman Empire joined Germany when war broke out in 1914. Now, Germany also had interests in the Middle East, and that's one of the reasons they built the Berlin-Baghdad Railway, and eventually one of the reasons why the Turks chose to fight with the Germans as well. Now, once the war breaks out, the French and British, and Russians in particular, are already thinking about what to do with the Middle East after the war. And in 1914, they issue the Declaration of London, which says that all of the Allied powers have to be consulted in how the Middle East is going to be redrawn. But what the British do is they go a little bit against this Declaration of London. Now, they're doing most of the fighting in the Middle East against the Turks, and they reach out to a guy by the name of, and I'm going to check my notes here, Hussein ibn Ali al-Hashimi. He's the head of the Hashemite family, a very powerful family, and a religious leader in Mecca. And they try to convince him to lead the Arabs in revolt to help their war effort against the Turks. So British diplomat Sir Henry McMahon corresponds with Hussein, and they're offering and counter-offering about what's going to happen in the Middle East and what they can give each other. And the deal in the end is that Hussein will lead the Arabs in revolt, and the British will create an independent Arab kingdom, which is likely going to be ruled by one or more of his sons. The problem with the McMahon-Hussein agreement is that it's quite vague and sort of open to interpretation. So naturally, the British are going to interpret it one way as giving less, and the Hashemites are going to interpret it another way as giving more. And one of the things that was left open were the borders question. So it's not clear what the exact borders of this new Arab kingdom, which is going to be centered on Syria, are going to be. And places like Lebanon and Transjordan and Palestine are not really considered at all. Now, obviously, the French are not very happy about this kind of arrangement, and they start to press their interests with the British. Here's what French diplomat François-Georges Picot had to say to his British allies. Syria was very near the heart of the French, and that now, after the expenditure of so many lives, France would never consent to offer independence to the Arabs, though at the beginning of the war, she might have done so. It was unthinkable that the French people would acquiesce in the placing of Christians of the Lebanon under a Mohammedan rule. So by the end of 1915, there's some growing tension between the British and the French because of this McMahon-Hussein agreement between the British and the Hashemites. 
So what happens is there's a diplomatic meeting, a series of diplomatic meetings between a British diplomat, Sir Mark Sykes, and the French diplomat, François-Georges Picot. And they come up with the famous Sykes-Picot Agreement, which basically says that the Middle East will be divided between Russia, France, and Britain, and that there will be an Arab kingdom, it just won't be particularly independent. The British are going to get the influence in the southern part of the kingdom, and the French are going to receive influence in the northern part of the kingdom. Now, this new arrangement caused waves within British circles as well, because it's in direct contradiction to the McMahon-Hussein agreement. One British who wasn't such a fan of the arrangement was General George McDonough, who was the head of intelligence at the War Office. And here's what he had to say. I must confess that it seems to me that we are rather in the position of the hunters who divided up the skin of the bear before they had killed it. I personally cannot foresee the situation in which we may find ourselves at the end of the war, and I therefore think that any discussion at the present time of how we're going to cut up the Turkish Empire is chiefly of academic interest. But in spite of the divided opinions in Britain, the Sykes-Picot arrangement is on the books. But then the British go and they make another promise in the Middle East that further complicates the situation. And what they decide is that they issue the Balfour Declaration in 1917, which states that the British government will help the Jews establish a homeland for themselves in Palestine. So what the British are doing in the Middle East is they're portraying themselves and positioning themselves as the liberators of different people who'd been under the so-called Ottoman yoke in the Ottoman Empire. This is true for the Arabs and also for the Jewish population. Many noble Arabs have perished in the cause of Arab freedom at the hands of those alien rulers, the Turks, who oppressed them. It is the determination of the government of Great Britain and the great powers allied to Great Britain that these noble Arabs shall not have suffered in vain. Now, once the war ends at the end of 1918, British and French troops move in and occupy the region, which is in a state of famine, in particular in Lebanon. And now that they're in control of the region, the old British and French colonial rivalry begins to come back a little bit. For example, Lloyd George was worried that the French would receive too much in the Middle East from the peace deal without having done that much of the fighting there. So he told French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, I wonder if you have any rights to make claims under the Sykes-Picot Agreement after having refused to take part in the effort that made its execution possible. This new difficulty led to renewed discussions between the British and the French at the Paris Peace Conference, and the proposed borders of the Middle Eastern kingdoms were slightly changed in favor of the British. Nonetheless, France was still to get control of Syria, and this is how Lloyd George justified it. He said that the friendship of France was worth 10 Syrias. So the British and French had sealed another deal that went against the British agreement with the Hashemites. But now, once the war was ending, the whole situation would be changed by the entry of the US into the international arena, and in particular, by Wilson's 14 points and the concept of self-determination. The newly formed League of Nations was now supposed to oversee the creation of new states, some of whom would be under its so-called mandate system, where more developed countries would be assigned to assist less developed countries in the eyes of the League of Nations on their road towards full independence. So once the peace conference is underway, Hussein tries to play his cards. He has since learned about the Sykes-Picot Agreement and hopes that if he petitions the peace conference, he will still be able to get an independent Arab kingdom under the auspices of the principle of self-determination. But both the peace conference and later the League of Nations never intended for self-determination to really be applied to peoples outside of Europe. Certain communities formerly belonging to the Turkish Empire have reached a stage of development where their existence as independent nations can be provisionally recognized subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such time as they are able to stand alone. The wishes of these communities must be a principal consideration in the selection of the mandatory.
but it wasn't clear what exactly the mandate system would mean in reality. And the Hashemite advisor, Rustam Haidar, put this point to the peace conference. What does the word mandate mean? We do not exactly know. I only wish to say that the nations in whose name I speak intend to remain free to choose the power whose advice they will ask. Their right to decide their fate in the future has been recognized in principle. Very well. But you will allow me to say, gentlemen, that a secret agreement to dispose of these nations has been prepared, about which we have not been consulted. I ask the Assembly whether this state of things ought to exist or not. Now, at first, the British and French were worried that the League of Nations mandate system would sort of put a break on their ambitions to have more influence in the Middle East. But as time went by, they realized that they might be able to use the mandate system to exert exactly the kind of influence that they had planned in the first place, especially since the US rejected the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles and did not join the League of Nations. But there was still a hitch with the British and French plans for the Middle East, because the League of Nations said that local populations had to be consulted about which power they would want as a mandatory for their country. Now, we do have some information about what the Arab populations of the Middle East were thinking at that time, thanks to the activities of the US King Crane Commission, which was in the Middle East in 1919. So I've got a few of the statistics in my notes, and I'll share them with you now. 80% um, of the people who spoke to the commission wanted a unified and independent Syria. Now, among this group, they were split pretty much 50-50, between those who wanted a democratic Syria and those who wanted a monarchy under Faisal. Faisal was the son of Hussein, of the Hashemite family. Now the preference for a mandate was, the first choice was the US. Failing that, they were willing to accept Britain as a mandatory power, but they were not particularly interested in France as a mandatory power. Except for the Lebanese Christian community, which was in favor of French involvement. 55% of those who spoke to the commission were not in favor of mandates whatsoever. And less than 1% of those who communicated their desires to the commission were in favor of the British program for a Zionist Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now this data from the King Crane Commission came in the form of petitions. And I want to give you an example of one of the nearly 2,000 petitions that were sent to the commission by a carpenter's guild in the town of Tripoli, which at the time was part of what was known as Greater Syria. We, the undersigned members of the carpenter's guild, request the full independence of the Syrian country within its natural borders, based on the following conditions. The political independence of Syria, we object to the Section 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations concerning the mandate. We are against the Israelite migration to our country. We refuse the request of some people that Lebanon get its independence. We demand a constitutional monarchy, civilian and decentralized, headed by Emir Faisal. This group of carpenters went on to say that if they needed any help for the new country of Syria, they would prefer to get advice from the United States, and if that wasn't possible, Britain, but under no circumstances, France. Now, the League of Nations and the British and French also received several thousand petitions from the local population, and the League officials were divided on how to respond. The director of mandates at the League, William Rappard, wrote about this problem to the Secretary General. I cannot bring myself to feel that we are doing our full duty toward the inhabitants of these territories. Their protests are certainly often naive and badly worded, but I do feel that they can make out a strong case against the way in which they have been and are being treated. The Secretary General, Eric Drummond's reply was less than empathetic. The wishes of the inhabitants is only the concern of the mandatory power and not the council. I have continually stated that I do not think that documents such as these, which contain absurd allegations, should be circulated. So the locals didn't get much sympathy from the highest ranks 
of the League of Nations, and they certainly didn't get much from the British and French either, who basically ignored the petitions that were sent to them. Now, this would turn out to be a political mistake because there was a long tradition in Ottoman times of local populations communicating with the authorities, traditionally with the Sultan, by way of petitions. Because the British and French ignored the petitions that were sent to them, it certainly did not help them ingratiate themselves to the local populations that they intended to indirectly rule. So at this point, the British find themselves in a difficult situation. They don't want to give too much influence in the Middle East to their French colonial rivals, and they don't want to create an independent Arab kingdom under the Hashemite family, because that might also pose problems for British interests in the Middle East. So the British are divided. General Allenby, who was commanding British troops in the, re in the region, and T.E. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia, both favored allowing Faisal to become king of an Arab kingdom. And at this stage, Lloyd George, the prime minister, started to minimize the role of the Arabs during the war. What the Arabs were apt to overlook is the fact that their contribution in the conquest of Palestine and Syria was almost insignificant compared with that of the British Empire. The Arabs only claimed that their army mustered in all 100,000 light cavalry. Eastern arithmetic is proverbially romantic. Now, French claims in the region received a bit of a boost from the vocal support of the Lebanese Christian minority. The Lebanese Christians feared that an Arab kingdom might make territory demands on what they saw as Lebanese territory. And these fears were articulated by the, one of the Lebanese Christian patriarchs, and forgive me about the Arabic pronunciation here, Elias Hoaek, who told the peace conference, our wishes can be expressed in very few words. The independence of Lebanon restored within its natural borders with the help and assistance of our longtime friend, France. All my efforts will be aimed at obtaining, in accordance with the Lebanese national will, the complete independence of my country with the help of France. Now, the position of the Maronite Christian community fit well with France's traditional policy of seeing itself as the protector of Christians in the Middle East. All this despite the fact that according to the King Crane Commission, 57% of the Lebanese people did not favor independence. Now, as time went by, tension between the different groups in the Middle East began to grow, and there were outbreaks of violence between different ethnic groups, political groups, and religious faiths. The British, in the end, decided to essentially withdraw from Syria and see what happened. This left the French to negotiate with Faisal and the supporters of the Arab Kingdom. Now, the French put pressure on Faisal to allow them to have indirect control over the coming Syrian kingdom. At first, he gave in to the pressure and he agreed. But the group supporting him, known as the Syrian Congress, which consisted of politicians and intellectuals, were opposed to this arrangement and to having France as a mandatory power. So they in turn put pressure on Faisal to go back on his agreement with the French, which he did. And in the first week of March 1920, he was crowned King of Syria. The French were not very pleased with this turn of events and issued an ultimatum to Faisal. He had to accept their indirect control over his new kingdom or face the military consequences. So by the spring of 1920, it seemed like war might be coming between France and the new Syrian kingdom under Faisal. But in the new diplomatic context of international relations, things would not be so easy to solve for the colonial powers. It seemed like an international conference would be a better solution than typical naked imperial force. And this is why the Conference of San Remo took place in April 1920. Now, those who attended the conference were not all the members of the League of Nations, but only the powers that had been victorious in the First World War, France, Britain, Italy, and Japan. The United States was present at the conference, but only had an observer status and was not involved in making the decisions. In this context, it's clear that the British and French would be able to push through the solutions that were most advantageous to their policies in the Middle East. And indeed, when the San Remo resolution came out at the end of the conference, the decision was made that League of Nations mandates would be put in place for Syria, Palestine, and Mesopotamia. 
the French would receive the mandate in Syria, and the British in Palestine and Mesopotamia. Now, these were supposed to be Class A mandates, which was the class of mandates for what the League considered to be the most advanced mandate countries. Palestine was a little bit of an exception because the British would have more direct control in order, among other things, to allow for the resettlement of Jewish immigrants from other parts of the world in the planned Jewish homeland. Now, one of the problems with the resolution was that it left much to be defined. The borders were still an open question, and it was planned that they would be set only later in 1920, when a peace treaty was finally signed between the Ottoman Empire and the Allied powers. This would take place in August at the Treaty of Sèvres. Another problem was the fact that the resolution of the Conference of San Remo did not deal with Transjordan or with Lebanon, so these questions were left open as well. Now, in theory, the League of Nations was supposed to oversee how the French and British were carrying out their duties as mandatory powers. The French and British would have to report to the League on their activities, and the League could ask them for explanations about different issues. But in practice, the League had virtually no power. In fact, the Class A mandates in reality were little more than colonies, as historian Michael Province has written. The populations of the mandated territories thus assumed all the responsibilities and none of the benefits of national sovereignty. This meant that the British and French were free to use their extensive powers in order to further their own agendas and to limit any moves towards political independence from the populations in the region. They were able to veto laws, constitutions, and influence decisions about electoral boundary districts in the countries that they had mandatory power over. And in particular, they were able to use these tools to limit the influence of the majority and increase the influence of the minorities that were favorable to British and French presence in the region, mostly Christians and Jews. So by the end of the San Remo Conference in April 1920, it seemed like the French and British had gotten their way in the Middle East. Indirect control, without the added expense of direct colonialism. But things would not be as simple and as cheap as the French and British expected, because by the spring of 1920, Palestine, Syria, and Mesopotamia were about to explode in violence. Thanks again to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this episode. CuriosityStream is an online streaming service that has thousands of documentaries that you can watch if you sign up for just $11.99 per year. To sign up, you can go to curiositystream.com slash the great war. If you do, you'll also get access to Nebula. On Nebula, you can watch the newest episodes of the great war ad free, along with great content from other creators. And you get all this packaged in with your subscription to CuriosityStream. We want to thank one of our top Patreon supporters, Rabbi Rashed, as well as Mark Newton for their help with this episode. And I also want to thank all of you for watching and especially all of you who support us on Patreon, uh, especially in these trying times. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode in our new and temporary studio here in my living room. We really appreciate your support and it's that ongoing support that allows The Great War to survive and provide you content like this even though it's slightly modified for the historic times that we find ourselves in right now. If you want to support us and you haven't done so yet, you can do so on Patreon. You can also buy some of our merchandise and we would be very grateful for that support. This is Jesse Alexander. That's not how I say it. I'm Jesse Alexander and this... <laughs> I'm Jesse Alexander and this is The Great War 1920, a production of real-time history and the only YouTube history channel that makes for mandatory viewing.